We'll be covering securing windows. This is not going to be an in-depth, like looking at binaries and trying to secure them. This is going to be an approach to get you kind of in the mood for how to secure windows and how to deal with both local and corporate environments. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about that soon. Uh, there we go. Oops. Ignore joke. All right. So announcements for this week. Uh, the Sharif CTF will be Friday starting at 1 p.m. Uh, these are our lab hours, so 1 to 5 p.m. on Friday, and then on February 3rd, on Saturday, we'll have them from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. in ECSS 4.619, that's our lab. Um, additionally, right after that, there's a beginner-friendly pen testing session that's helping out a research group on campus, and I mean, it's also a good way to just learn a little bit of pen testing. It'll be kind of step-by-step, -step, them telling you what to do, and so you can kind of learn a little bit that way. Um, do additionally. You all, do you all have like, if you're interested in coming to the pen testing session on Saturday, can you like raise your hand? Because they would like to have an idea of numbers that will be coming. Like raise it high enough where I can count you. Fair amount. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, also, we're hoping to get fire talks um, within March and April. Um, so look forward to that. And then we are streaming on Twitch TV, so Careful what you say. We don't want to get ourselves in trouble. Um, but yeah, so if you can't make a meeting, that will be good because uh, not only does it go to Twitch, you can also view it on our YouTube channel, which I don't remember the username for, but I will get that for you all. So done. This is the end of the presentation. We have secured Windows. That's all we need to do, just add some bars. Unfortunately, it's not quite that easy. <laughs> Um, we are talking about the software rather than actual windows, and that's still, you could take a nice uh, saw or something and saw off those bars, so not quite secure. Um, so our goals for today are to learn ways to be able to protect a personal Windows install um, using tools that Windows has and using the features and, and yeah, the features that it has already included. Um, additionally, we're going to talk a little bit about Active Directory and why it, what it is and why it sucks, but not really. It's actually very useful because a lot of people use it, so very useful. Um, we will also discuss Windows tools that will help in securing the personal and corporate Windows. So absolute security. If you want absolute security, don't ever turn on your laptop or system or whatever it is. Hide it somewhere send it off into the sun. You won't ever have to worry about it being insecure because no one's going to be able to access it. Unfortunately, that's not at all feasible. We need to find ways in order to interact with other people and other systems on the internet and still be secure. So this will be starting off some general advice. Uh, drive encryption is good because if someone manages to, for example, steal your laptop, they shouldn't be able to get in as long as you have a decently good password that people aren't able to guess. Um, for a lot of Windows installations in like a corporate environment, they will use BitLocker in order to, I mean, make it just that case where people aren't able to get in, steal corporate documents and stuff, but it's only available for pro, enterprise, and education licenses for Windows 10 specifically. Um, another option is Veracrypt, which is fairly good third-party alternative. Uh, another general advice, and I'm, the reason I'm going through these general advices are that no matter what operating system you're doing or using, you are going to have the issue of if you don't have the, the very basics that span everything in place, then you're st still going to be vulnerable. So strong passwords are very important. Like it says there, strong defenses are only strong if they have the, the ways to access them are well protected. And so in general case, that is with passwords. So this is kind of a low minimum, um, 15 characters, but that's if you have it completely random. But unfortunately, that's not as easy to do. So a more optimal solution is to kind of find a happy medium between like a thousand characters or like 80 different words strung together and like 15 characters that are completely random. And so a good medium is, I mean, having some randomness, having mixed case, basically variety within your passwords and making it something that 
wouldn't be easily guessed. One of my favorite solutions is diceware. So rolling some dice and it corresponds to a word and then you string together a few of those words that are picked at random and it's out of, I think, 7,000 something words. So seven, or if you string together five, five to the 7,000 something is not gonna be guessed within the span of our lifetimes. Um, all better alternative solutions are key-based login or two-factor authentication. However, that's not always feasible, so it's just good to have strong passwords. Uh, access control is highly important. Um, I mean, if, if someone who is lower level in some corporate environment, for example, Jill from Corporate Party Planning, has access to the most important machine within the, the company, then there's something wrong there. They should never have that kind of access if they don't need it. So that brings in the principle of least privilege, which is you only get the privileges that you absolutely need in order to accomplish the tasks that you are supposed to do. So um, very important to, to do that. And that's originally was proposed by Saltzer and Schroeder in their, I think it was 1975 paper, Basic Principles on Information Protection. So way back when they had the smart idea that that was important and it continues until today. Uh, other general advice is regular backups because sometimes, and I'm not recommending that you do this in every case, sometimes it's easier to just scrap whatever is going wrong and go back to a known safe point. However, if you have the vulnerability there, uh, like if there's a vul uh, vulnerability that's being uh, exploited, it's going to be in the older backups too. So you still need to fix your vulnerabilities, but it is important to have regular backups in order to, to make sure that if something does go wrong, you can go back to a known safe point. And for that, the backup settings within Windows, uh, for Windows 10, it's called backup settings. In older versions, it's backup and restore. That's a easy way on Windows to be able to, to back up your system or back up certain sections of your operating system. So done through the, the kind of boring part. Um, hopefully this will be a little more new or exciting for you all. Um, Command and PowerShell, these are very important to know. Hopefully you'll learn PowerShell instead of having to use the command line as is because the command line can be a little bulky and harder to learn. Whereas PowerShell is a newer shell that Windows came up with based on Unix uh, and Unix based shells, so like Bash or ZSH or any of those. Um, so it's very useful. Additionally, you can create your own modules for it using Visual Basic or dot and .NET. So that's, that's really useful if you want to kind of create your own utilities, find out how they work, you have the ability to. Um, additionally, it is a unified interface to interact with the systems, utilities, and services. So this is important for both, you can do uh, scripts, the PowerShell scripts that will do a chain of commands, or you can also, within that, include the WMI Windows Management Interface, which helps to be able to, uh, to manage multiple systems across a wide area. You can send certain commands if it's a trusted system, and you can basically manage stuff remotely uh, fairly easily using that. And if you learn to use PowerShell with Windows, it will save you many hours of point and click because it, it can take a while going across the screen with a, the uh, cursor and then clicking certain settings and all of that stuff, whereas most of it can be done with PowerShell. So good thing to learn. Um, another thing that is important with Windows is to know what is running. If you don't know what's running, you don't know if something is not supposed to be running. Um, for example, there are programs that you can, well, you can designate programs to start up whenever someone either logs in or even when the, the system boots into the operating system. Um, this is for a specific user when it logs in, that address, or I guess that directory. Um, and if you put a, an application there, it will start it up as soon as the user logs in. That is important in the case of checking to see if you have been attacked because that's a good way to check for persistence. If there's some sort of application that you have no clue where it came from that is in there, and then most likely there's something wrong with your system and someone's probably in there. Um, for Windows, you can use PowerShell to view the running processes. So that is done with git process command, which I've got a little example here. This is a 
more detailed example, but you can get specific details about whatever the service is that it's running. So this will show file version, product version, and the company that produces it. So that can be useful for, for finding specific um, running processes. And you can also do, just like with bash scripting, you can do the negation of whatever you're doing, like the negation of a search. So you can search for all of the known companies that should be that should have software on there, and if you have something pop up, then that may be suspicious. So that's that is a very useful command to know. Um, another useful thing is Windows Event Viewer. So the Windows Event Viewer is basically how it's a nice graphical user interface to be able to view what has taken place on your system so far. So it's all the logs that it accumulates. Um, that is located generally, the default save location is within the logs directory at the end of that long uh, absolute path. Um, but it contains three different types of messages that you'll see. These are the three main ones. It also has a different name for the security-based events. They call, it calls them audits, but they're essentially uh, information, or they essentially boil down to these three. Um, and this is a nice view of it. The reason why I show this is because that way you can see kind of how it looks. But also, this is a base Windows 10 install. Um, this is the enterprise, and it still has errors. So if you are looking through the event viewer um, and you see a bunch of errors, that's actually partially how it is. I mean, you can have everything perfectly secure and everything running up to standards, and you may still see warnings and errors just because Windows is, is a nice, uh, unique operating system that sometimes just has a few things in the background that don't quite work out. Um, but it's also important about these errors, and another thing, this probably won't affect any of you, but um, a lot of telephone scammers will actually use event viewer in order to scam people over the phone. They'll have them go and look at event viewer and they'll show them some sort of error that they know to be occurring or something that would generally be occurring on a computer and they'll freak people out and say, hey, there's something wrong with your system. How about you let us in there with remote desktop being able to access it remotely and fix it for you. And then they put malware or they do ransomware or something of that sort. So it's important to have a knowledge that sometimes the errors you see need further investigation as a good way to, to view that. Um, don't just say, oh, there's an error. Something's about to crash my system completely, although it could be, but usually won't be. Um, another important part of Windows is the registry. So the registry is basically the settings for all applications within your, your Windows uh, system. And so any applications you have may have certain uh, checks within the registry. Either sometimes they're passwords, sometimes it's other uh, sub registry keys, and so it can nest up to 512 levels deep, which is absolutely enormous. I think by the point that you get to that many levels, either you've got a very unbalanced tree, for those of you who have done a little bit of data structures, or you aren't able to access your system because you've run out of memory. So. Um, hopefully never experience a 512 level <laughs> registry. Um, so in addition to the settings, it's also good for access control. Um, so that's another key component to the access control general advice that I gave. Important registry keys, these are just a few. There's thousands out there that you could say are important, but these are some of the ones in security related uh, or that are security related that are important. For example, disallow run, you can disallow the running of certain executable files. Um, you can also disable remote desktop, which is a way to access certain systems remotely through a network. Um, you can restrict anonymous SAM. So the security, oh, I don't remember, security access manager, I'm probably, I may be wrong with that, but it's basically where the passwords are stored on Windows. Uh, they're hashed within there, and so if if an anonymous user can basically list all of the pa the hash passwords in there, that's a serious issue. This one usually won't be enabled. This might be more of a red flag if you see this enabled, because that may mean that someone's trying to 
anonymously access your information. They've had some way to, to cause it to flip the, the permissions and be able for them to read it anonymously. So, um, but that is an important one to know about. Um, additionally, the RNG seed, there's a bunch of other uh, parent parts of the tree before the RNG seed. That's just the last part of it, but I didn't want to just put seed because that's a little, I don't know, it seemed a little uh, vague. But anyway, the RNG seed is useful because, I mean, your system needs certain, uh, for certain applications and stuff, it needs a random seed. And so that is, or it needs a random number and initialization vector or something of that sort. And so that can be used in order to uh, to basically get the seed that it was that it started the random number generator with, and you can potentially reverse whatever the initialization vector or whatever it was using it for is. So that's another important one. Um, and then there's the H key classes root. So this contains basically a mapping of the extension of a file to uh, the file it runs. So if you were to alter that to where it thinks that it's running a uh, Let's see, it thinks it's running a .bat file, but it's actually an .exe or something. Then you could potentially trick a system to running a malicious file um, or running it in a software that can't handle whatever it is and exploit that. So uh, that's a good one to know. All right, so for those of you who are very privacy minded, the tinfoil hats, um, unfortunately Windows has a lot of tracking that it does that people may not know about. Um, so a, the first step is if you don't want them tracking you, then don't link it to a Microsoft account. They have a tracking ID that they have for people who have Microsoft accounts. It doesn't necessarily have your name, but it basically can be identified what you have viewed in the past, and they can tailor ads to, uh, for what you might like in the future. So if you don't necessarily like that kind of tracking, then you can uh, create a local account. Additionally, you can disable some of those services. There is a privacy menu, which I'll show soon, which you can select what they will be able to track. Unfortunately, you can't quite turn off everything. Um, there are a few third-party uh, scripts and stuff that probably work, but I didn't want to say, oh, go run these, and then one of them's malicious or something of that sort. So. Definitely look into something if you're like, I can't stand any sort of tracking of, of anything about me. Then those may be a solution for you, but look carefully at what they do. Make sure you trust them before you run them. Um, additionally, you can limit which apps can utilize certain parts of your computer, like the camera, the microphone, location, all of that stuff. So real quick, let me pull up the... So, got a nice little Windows 10 VM here. Um, the user is me because it's me. Um, <laughs> and we wait. It'll open soon, I promise. I think. <laughs> it just updated, so it could have been broken. Oh, yeah, that's true. It was doing an update while we were trying to get everything ready. Nope, it worked. Excellent. All right, so for those of you looking to limit the uh, the tracking and that variety of stuff. Sorry, it's running a little slow. It's only four gigs. I only have eight gigs total for my laptop of yeah. RAM. So it, uh, but uh, two important ones are the Cortana and the privacy. Cortana deals a lot with like microphone and that kind of stuff. Oops, let's close out Slack. Um, and so you may want to limit some of the stuff that Cortana can do or even completely prevent Cortana from, from running. However, the trade-off is is there's lots of great algorithms and stuff that, uh, that can help you be more efficient with your searches and that variety of stuff. Um, I don't want Cortana on when my device is locked, so you can do stuff like that. Um, you can prevent it from being able to use the microphone and much more, um, but the, the more important uh, settings that are directly related to privacy um, are right here. So this is a base install, so it's allowing it to use the advertising ID so that it can tailor st uh, websites and, and other advertising for you. Um, it can provide local or locally relevant. It can also allow 
certain apps to track information about you. Um, let's see, location is specifically important because I don't want them to be able to locate me, so turn that off. Um, you can also set a default location, so you know, set it to some other country or something of that sort. <laughs> and that's when you are not connected to, um, when you're not connected to, I believe, a network. Uh, oh, when it can't get a more exact location. Um, then you can also choose which apps are able to use your location, but since I turned everything off, that should be fine. Additionally, you can go through camera and microphone and that kind of stuff. Um, the speech is kind of where the microphone comes in quite a bit um, with, with like Cortana and that kind of stuff. So those are important settings to, to know about because most people aren't aware of how to disable some of that stuff. So definitely worth knowing about. Let's move that back over here. Oops, no. All right. So make sure that if you don't trust Windows and it's tracking, then you, you turn off some of those settings. So Active Directory, that was kind of a, the first part was more of a local view. This is more in a network. Uh, that's exactly what Active Directory does. It's a directory of what systems and users are within a network. Um, and it keeps that kind of within a database. And it utilizes, utilizes a concept called domains. So domains are basically a computer network, but with all the user information, systems, security policies, all of that within a central database so that, for example, if one computer wants to access some other system within the network, it can find the necessary information to route its traffic to that specific system, or it can try and authenticate in there, and it will check if it has the correct permissions. Um, and I will go into that a little bit more very soon. Um, so an Active Directory is just a service that allows the management of a wide network. And sometimes you can do it beyond just a single domain. You'll have multiple domains. And that kind of brings up the concept of a forest, because it organizes the, the users and the systems within a tree structure. Um, and so you'll have the domain, and then you'll have an organizational unit, and then you may have a user, or you can have other tiers beyond that. So. Um, that is good to know. Oh, I have not been looking at the questions, so let me look at these and see if there are any questions. There are plenty of questions. Um, uh, where will the slides be available specifically for specifically the pen testing event info? Um, the slides will be posted to our website tonight. Um, the old slides have currently not been migrated since we switched up the site. Oh, okay, um, yeah. Are you so? Is that question referring to uh, the pen testing event or the pen testing slides we did from last semester? So these slides will be up like for sure tonight. Uh, the old slides will hopefully be up by this weekend, um, but we need to upload them to the new website we host them on uh, because we no longer host them locally. Um, we'll send out a message in Slack when they're all pushed up. Um, another question. Um, does cleaning registry, uh, sorry, that went to, does cleaning registry help in securing windows or not? Um, I'm not quite sure what is meant by cleaning registry. Whoever asked that question, if you want to speak out, then I may be able to answer it, but I'm not sure exactly what is meant. Uh, by just that question. Um, but one thing I forgot to mention about the registry is that you should not be editing the registry unless you are sure of what it is doing because you could potentially delete or alter a record, um, one of the registry keys that could crash your system if you do the wrong one. Um, so it, it is important to know what you're doing before you, before you mess with the registry. Um, it is possible to create new registry keys also. If you create your own application, you want it to have certain um, configuration details, then you could create your own registry keys for those. Um, why am I ignoring some of the questions? Um, <laughs> I mean, I can ask them. 
I will answer questions afterwards. I see I'm already running a little bit late on time, but I will answer all questions afterwards. Um, so on to why do you need to know about Active Directory? Almost every company and government across the world uh, uses some Verizon, not Verizon, some version of Active Directory. Um, it's just Microsoft is so pervasive within large networking environments that it's very important to know. Uh, for blue and red team roles, if you're comfortable with it, blue team, you can hopefully secure it fairly well to the best of everyone's knowledge at that certain point. For red team, if you know how everything works, you can potentially know where there is where things are either difficult to do and look for vulnerabilities there, or you can look where things interconnect and say, hey, I know this should be working this way, but it doesn't quite work that way right now and exploit it. So very useful to have that kind of knowledge. Um, additionally, the dominance of Windows will not be going away anytime soon. Um, it's just that's the way it is. It's heavily ingrained in corporate and government environments. Uh, domain controllers, that is basically what is controlling everything. So you have a domain admin or multiple domain admins that can log into there. Additionally, you can have multiple servers acting as the domain controllers. So you can potentially have some strange issues with that in my experience, just where things don't quite sync up right. Usually if you, uh, if you just restart some of the services, it will work, but there are times where it can get a little bit out of sync if you have multiple ones. Um, let's see. Uh, it uses LDAP, that is Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. Um, and that is basically how it lists the information. So it will list what domain uh, controller it's coming from, and then the organizational unit, the user. You can add and delete users and do a bunch of stuff like that. Authentication is done with Kerberos, which we'll talk about a lot more once we get to the domain hacking um, later on. Um, and then there's Samba, which is used for network shares. That's SMB, um, if anyone's familiar with that. Once again, that's something we'll cover a little bit more in depth later on. This is just kind of to introduce you to these topics. And then beyond just the domain controller, usually there's a DNS server for looking up where certain systems are. Uh, the update server, the Windows Services Update Server, I think is what that stands for. It's just for updating. Um, exchange email server and then network shares. So anything like file shares somewhere in the network or even printers or anything of that sort. It's just common to see lots of different elements to it. Um, so Active Directory, like I said, uses a tree structure to keep track of the users. So this is kind of how it looks. This shows the forest concept. So you've got multiple domains and then it enlarges this domain right here to show that there are multiple organizational units. So this could be like marketing, um, marketing the technical services and then something else. But within there you have multiple users and multiple systems that pertain to that specific organizational unit. All right, a group policy is very important with Active Directory because that is a way to set rules across your network. So this is kind of like the, the larger scale network access control for Active Directory, and it's centralized management configuration of users and systems and the, their accounts. Um, the important thing to know is that once you set these rules, you can import and export them. So if you have a, a home network and you're like, wow, don't actually, let's say you have a corporate, no, you don't want to take settings from, if you have two different networks that you both own and you're not going to get in trouble for importing or exporting the set of rules that you have for the access control, then you can import and export them and it will basically allow you to have the same policies. Um, with group policy, there is so there are the rules and then there are preferences. The preferences are settings that are preferred by the admin but aren't enforced. And if you are storing passwords within group policy preferences, the key is very openly available online through Microsoft even. And so you will be able to decrypt the passwords that you have within the XML files that it's using. So be very careful if you do that. And if you have to have passwords included within there, which usually isn't the case, then make sure they're a password that isn't needed to be secure. All right, on to Nick with threat protection.
All right. Um, there was one question I saw that I wanted to answer. Uh, not directly related, but fairly close. Um, so how well would you say that containerized services such as Docker and Windows 20 Server 2016 add security to existing applications, preventing breakout to infect the host? Um, so the issue with containers uh, fundamentally is uh, although they're compared to virtualization platforms, they're not. Uh, they share the kernel. Uh, if you don't know what the kernel is, it's the underlying OS layer that provides all of your core functionality. Um, you probably may have heard of the Linux kernel. Windows does have a kernel as well. Uh, and so uh, if your bra application breaks out of the um, application itself and you have a malicious actor gain control of that, uh, any kernel level exploit still infects the entire host. Uh, and so you have application level se separa separation, but the kernel can still be infected. And so, for example, stat clash, the vulnerability that came out in summer of 2016 for Linux, or summer of 2017 for Linux, um, can indeed cause um, a breakthrough in Docker. Um, if you're really interested in that, uh, once again, easier to do on Linux because everything is freely available for other researchers. Uh, the dirty cow exploit that came out in 2016 uh, has a proof of concept breaking out of Docker. Um, and so it's useful, but if you're looking at actors who are going to break your kernel, uh, containers are not the solution for you. And back to threat protection. Uh, and so the domain of Windows threat protection um, has pretty drastically shifted in the last three years. Um, previously, you had a lot of first-party tools that were very poorly advertised and generally not very well documented uh, that provided a lot of the tool, the tooling that you would use, things like um, the Ma Microsoft Baseline Security Analyzer, the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit, um, something along those lines, uh, Sysmon, a bunch of these utilities that Microsoft provided to end users uh, but no one knew about because they weren't built in nor were they well advertised. Uh, and in, in light of this, and because some of them sucked, uh, a lot of companies have made a lot of money by making these third-party applications that do some more functionality. Uh, so a lot of companies like FireEye do provide threat protection on Windows. Uh, those are expensive appliances and are generally looking at volumes of 1,500 users minimum, and so it's not necessarily practical for home user use. Um, but if you're dealing with any sort of corporate environment, you'll likely see that. And so uh, we're focusing here more on Windows 10 because Windows 10 is where Microsoft really tried to start innovating and bringing threat protection into their platform. Uh, and so most of these things do not apply earlier than Windows 10. Uh, and that's simply because threat protection pre-Windows 10 is a pretty heterogeneous environment. Um, it's kind of pick and choose tooling that isn't super well put together uh, and you don't really have a nice system unless you pay a lot of money for it. And so starting with threat protection, uh, like I previously said, the security suite of their tooling has just completely been radically shifted, uh, at least since my experience with it three years ago. And so anything that you used to use is probably either deprecated or becoming deprecated. And uh, the new things are absorbing a lot of functionality, but presenting themselves in new and in my opinion, but not others' opinions, better interfaces. Um, if you want to like see what it's like, you can ask people around. I know of someone who likes the old version way better, and he's ignoring me right now. <laughs> uh, so Windows 10 Enterprise. Uh, so Microsoft tiers their security support, unfortunately. And so if you're dealing with Windows 10, like Home Edition, you're not going to get a lot of the fun functionality simply because they don't think you need it. Uh, whether that's true or not, um, I'll let you decide. And so they have the Windows 10 Pro Edition, which is freely available if you're a student, maybe. Um, if you're a CS student, you can probably acquire it for free. Um, but that doesn't even contain everything anymore. Uh, they, have, it, they have stratified their tiers even farther. Uh, and so we're really focusing on every feature you can possibly get, which is available in Windows 10 Enterprise. Uh, available free for 30 days from this link. Uh, we'll have the slides up. Uh, worth playing with. Uh, you will get access to all sorts of functionality you didn't realize Windows could do. Uh, and it's, it's fairly neat. Uh, I quite enjoy playing with the Windows 10 Enterprise Edition, even though I do not like Windows in the least. And so we start with uh, their replacement to the Action Center. Um, right, Jace? Jace, Action Center, right? Yeah. So you have the Action Center, which previously told you um, like, oh, your firewall is turned off. Oh, you don't have an antivirus. Oh, you don't, whatever. Uh, they've replaced this with Security Center, uh, which is, I think, a better application. Once again, opinions vary. 
um, but it's a much cleaner interface and allows a user to get a good overview of the security of the endpoint. Um, by endpoint, I mean the Windows box itself uh, at a high level. Uh, and so, uh, as an aside, if you're using an antivirus, uh, you might want to be checking things out. Recently, Windows changed their kernel calls, which caused a lot of third-party antivirus solutions to not work. And so they set a key in your registry where you can't get updates because you have an antivirus they don't like. Um, if your antivirus has been updated and of course it's now set this registry key, you're fine. Um, but if you haven't gotten an update recently and you're wondering why, it's quite possibly your antivirus, uh, the joys of running a Windows machine. Uh, and of course, also application protection, uh, which is a, uh, it's a, it's a new add-on that was not available in the Action Center. And so to give you an idea of what it looks like, it's following the new Windows 10 scheme, uh, and it just kind of gives you green check marks to, I guess, try to convince you that you're doing good. Uh, whether that's true or not, uh, hopefully so. Um, but uh, it, it's a fairly neat system. And uh, integrated into this uh, is their actual fun functionality. Uh, that's a fairly, not radical thing, but it's a real large step that Windows is taking to make their the threat pr protection uh, a lot more verbose. And so they have Defender Exploit Guard. Uh, if you haven't seen the new shift in their line, uh, Windows Defender has eaten every other security tool Windows has previously offered, and now everything is Defender something. So like the firewall is no longer Windows Firewall, it's Windows Defender Firewall. Uh, and so in the case of Exploit Guard, uh, it's designed to be somewhat of a host intrusion prevention system. Uh, it's fairly neat, but also terribly limited when you look at other things that do the same thing that are a third-party appliance, unfortunately. Uh, the pros of this are a lot of it are already on your system and enabled or just require a quick line and PowerShell to enable. So that's kind of neat. Um, but the things it can do are somewhat limited, unfortunately. Um, but we'll, we'll still get into it. And if you've used uh, Emit before, uh, all of the functionality from Emit has been absorbed into Exploit Guard, uh, and Emit is now being deprecated in July of this year. So exploit protection, fairly neat system. Um, it sounds a lot cooler than it is, I think. Um, it includes things like data execution prevention, uh, making pages not that you can write to not executable, uh, control flow guard that tries to make sure other processes don't change where your, uh, your instruction pointer is, uh, address space layout randomization, uh, it's randomizing where programs fit in virtual memory so it's harder to attack. All of these things are very standard OS features. Like these exist in Linux and OS X and on Windows. Uh, exploit protection window, the exploit protection window has simply made these things easier to access for you as the user. Uh, they also offer various app level protections. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time looking into them because they want you to configure them on a per app basis. And so I'm not really sure how practical that is. There, I didn't see a way to set blanket rules other than the features listed here, um, plus a few others. Uh, one second as I go through the, uh, the questions again. Uh, can you talk more about the passwords and preferences policy file? Ian, you, you want to handle that real quick? Password. Oh. The group policy. So group policy preferences, if I'm correct, is stored a list of values that you could export and encrypt. Um, but this encryption key is publicly available. And so it's just like not encrypting them. And a lot of administrators have the bad practice of putting passwords where they shouldn't. And at some point, an administrator has put a password in this preferences policy file and it, it exported because it's encrypted and he thinks he's okay. Um, but because they can get the key, um, it, it's not actually encrypted. Be very careful where you put your passwords. And then we have attack surface reduction. Um, the closest part to an intrusion prevention system uh, that is built into Windows and attempts, attempts to disable potentially malicious behaviors. Uh, this allows you to block executable content from email and client and webmail, block office applications from creating child processes and like four other rules. Uh, but I couldn't find a way to set custom rules, and I couldn't find any documentation suggesting you could. Uh, so at its current state, it looks like you can only block six malicious behaviors, um, which is, I guess, good. It's better than nothing, uh, for sure better than nothing. 
Uh, it's fairly neat the level of integration it gets into your system. Uh, you can put it in either audit mode or block mode. Audit will just write to your event log uh, that you can then view with event viewer like Ian showed earlier. Uh, block mode will actually stop the behavior from happening and give you one of those little Windows Toast applications in the bottom right hand corner of your screen saying a malicious behavior was blocked. Uh, that was pretty neat. The interface is slick. Um, functionality is kind of lacking, unfortunately. Uh, network protection. Another kind of neat feature, um, it blocks outgoing traffic to known malicious domains. Uh, neat idea, uh, built into Windows, and so it's more difficult to, um, to, to, to go around. Um, unfortunately, I have no idea what domains are on that list. I couldn't find anything about them, nor could I find a way to add a domain to that list. And so you're kind of beholden to Microsoft saying, yes, this is a good domain, you can go to it, and no, this is a bad domain, you can't. Uh, and so if you turn this on and for some reason you can't access the Linux kernel, um, perhaps uh, Microsoft is just trying to lock you out. Who knows? Um, but once again, it can be done in audit and block mode and um, it is a useful feature um, in a large corporation where you trust Microsoft's set of uh, URLs. And lastly, a fairly neat idea uh, is controlled folder access. And this allows you to set... Uh, so it's marketed as a ransomware protection software. Um, after... Uh, Eternal Blue came out and all sorts of different, um, what was the name that we played with? What's the name of the, the ransomware that was super big? Wanna yeah, after WannaCry came out, like, oh man, ransomware was the buzzword of summer 2017. But after that, Windows, like, this is their response, I guess, as pitching this as a large security process, product, is it allows folders to be marked as protected, which is a fairly neat idea, I have to say. And so, Inside a protected folder, the only things that can write or read from that folder are whitelisted programs that you control. Um, and so I can take my home directory and say that only Microsoft Word can write to it. And uh, that's fairly handy. But once again, you run into this awkwardness of a lot of whitelisting. And so as a user, you might find this incredibly limiting. Um, this could likely be configured properly and managed, but you're going to deal with just kind of uh, jumping through a lot of hoops just to stop um, ransomware from running that you could just make sure you don't click anyway. Um, and so uh, it, it is what it is. But the neatest thing I think actually about these is they provided what they call the Defender Playground. And instead of just telling you about these features, they have now provided um, malicious applications that will test these features for you and show you how they work. Um, I have never actually seen this done with an IDS IPS system, like not packaged and well mentioned. Um, they do exist, but it doesn't give the integration that Microsoft gives. And so um, we'll demo that real quick. Uh, this is the primary reason I was somewhat impressed with the protections they added. So we go in and open my documents. Yeah, into downloads. Uh, and you can see the Windows Defender exploit guard evaluation. Uh, and once again, if you want to play with this, it's free for 90 days. I would highly recommend just poking at it. Having an idea of the direction Microsoft is going is significantly better than just being blind. Because if you as an attacker, um, in a pen testing job you get in the future that you were hired to do, um, if these detections are available and you don't know about them, you're likely to get caught. And so it's worthwhile to have an idea what's going on. So the most interesting one, uh, and unfortunately you may not be able to read the text, and so I'm sorry, I will narrate, is the, yeah, okay. So when you pull it up, the, your, your antivirus goes screaming because it knows it's a bad thing. Um, this is a VM, so I wouldn't, it's provided by Microsoft. I would say you can probably run it on your laptop, but I probably wouldn't. Um, because Windows, it, it's convinced this is malicious, um, and but that's kind of because it is. But you have a set of rules that you can try, um, actually seven, not six, my bad. And so not all of the scenarios have worked for me, so I don't know if that's an application or user error, but I believe the execution of potentially obfuscated scripts does work. And so we, we load the block policy. And so now my system is designed to block potentially obfuscated scripts. And then we clicked Run Scenario. And it attempts to load the script. And as you can see, we get an error message because it was blocked. And then you get to that nice Windows toast that popped up down there, uh, just telling you that this kind of attack was blocked. Um, 
I wouldn't say you should evaluate your security tools based off scripts written by the people who wrote them um, because you're likely not going to get full coverage. Um, but as far as demoing the tool, it's fairly neat uh, because we just had a proof of concept of some sort that a blocked obfuscated script, um, an obfuscated script was indeed blocked. Uh, and so that's a neat thing. They have a couple other ones. Uh, and they have event viewer XML files that you can load in and check and see, oh, this is what it's going to be writing to the logs. Uh, worthwhile if you're interested in Windows security. Yes. Sure. I don't know about the demo tool itself. Um, I didn't look into any how it loads the scripts or anything. It would not surprise me if you couldn't. But there's also nothing stopping you from the policies are well laid out. Like that one is exactly this is it blocks obfuscated scripts, and so you could likely go find obfuscated scripts online. Uh, they're not hard to come by. PowerShell Empire likely has some readily available to you, and you can attempt to attack it. Uh, if you're really interested in it, that's what I would recommend, is turn on these protections, go find Windows Exploitation Tooling, and just attack it and see what happens. Um, you should still get the toast message, because that's OS level, um, but you won't have the nice ability to toggle it and then run a script. Uh, Defender Application Guard. Uh, very similarly related to the question earlier about um, Docker containers and their security. Uh, Windows has taken this one step farther and they call them containers. I don't know if I would call them containers, uh, but they take your Internet Explorer or Edge session. Um, I don't believe it's anything else but Internet Explorer or Edge. Um, I could be wrong, but I didn't see any documentation supporting it wasn't. And so they take your session, and when you hit an untrusted link, likely provided by Microsoft that you have no control over, it spins up your Edge instance in a hypervised container. And so you do have kernel separation, according to it. Um, I didn't look into the actual technical specs, like deep down on how it's working. Uh, but they claim you have kernel level separation, and so this website cannot infect you. Uh, a really neat idea. I'm somewhat skeptical, because if you're actually spinning up a proper external kernel, uh, you're likely going to have a decent overhead. Uh, but it's quite possible that the integration is nice. Uh, the only unfortunate thing is you can't run it in a VM. So I can't demo it for you. And I'm not installing Windows 10 on any of my boxes uh, other than the one that I currently don't use. Uh, and so uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to try it out. And I think, I, yeah, I skipped a Windows smart screen. Uh, so prior mentioned was their network protections. Uh, fairly neat. Before that, and rebranded is Windows Smart Screen. And so it scans websites for malicious behavior. It claims to do some sort of content analysis, and then gives it a score, and then also checks it against a list of known bad URLs. Uh, and then it'll warn, warn the user that it thinks this is a bad site. And so if it thinks that you're on a phishing site, it will tell you that. Uh, but once again, I think this is only for Edge and Internet Explorer. Uh, it does scan all downloaded files, a functionality that um, I hated back when I used Windows because it would delete my files. But um, as that slowly improves, it will check your downloads from any web browser and warn you, say, hey, I think this is malicious. Um, as if you download their exploit guard evaluation package, uh, it will tell you that's malicious and that you should probably delete it. And lastly, um, event forwarding. Uh, I have finally with a question mark because this is something that's been available in Linux for a really long time, and Windows doesn't only recently made this a nice, well-supported feature. Um, it was previously provided by Sysmon. Uh, and so if you're in a Windows 7 environment, you might see Sysmon there. Um, but it is finally integrated into what is called a Windows event collector. And so you stream your logs away. Uh, this seems like not a super useful thing, because you're like, oh, why would I need to stream my logs? But an attacker on the box, if they're an administrator, they can just wipe the logs if they want, or they can forge the logs. So they can pretty much do whatever they want. And so the point of being able to stream your logs elsewhere is um, if Andrew hacks my laptop that's running Windows, um, I don't really care what the logs say on there because I can't trust it, but I can trust my server that he hasn't touched yet, uh, hopefully. And finally, unfortunately, the thing we can't demo is Windows Advanced Threat Protection uh, that I mentioned last week. Um, if you weren't here last week, it's somewhat of a security aggregation suite of software that allows you to stream all sorts of Windows information uh, into it. 
It's a fairly neat concept. Um, it's not anything new, I would say, because it's just a proper SIM tool that is actually branded by Microsoft. But the majority of this tooling supports streaming data back to the ATP appliance or ATP device. And so it sounds really neat. You have to wait seven days for them to approve your account. And so unfortunately, we didn't get in on time. And so I couldn't actually spin up a demo. Um, but I may record a video of it when I actually get access and post it in the CSG Slack. Or we may do a Saturday lab that interacts with it. Um, it's really neat software. Uh, if you're interested, there is a talk that we have linked in Slack. We can link again. That was at Black Hat Europe, talking about bypassing the protections they put in ATP. Uh, but it, it's really, really neat. Uh, it's worth looking at. And if you're actually into Windows security, um, it, it's worthwhile to take a look. And that is it as far as slides go. Um, I will scroll back through the questions real quick uh, and see if there's anything that I missed. How has Microsoft hurt you? Why do you keep dumping on them? Um, I am a Linux fanboy through and through, and I really like open source software that I can verify they're doing what they say they're doing. Um, you can't do that with Windows, unfortunately. And so take that for what you think. Um, if you enjoy Windows, I applaud your use of Windows, encourage you to keep using it. Um, but the fact that these features are only now coming out, I find a bit disheartening that Windows security took that long to become fully fledged. Uh, back to announcements for those who came in late. We have at the very beginning. Uh, next Saturday, this Friday and Saturday, we have a CTF going on. Uh, we will have the lab open with people in it and working on it. Uh, and that's ECS S4.619. Uh, Saturday at noon, right after the CTF ends, we'll start with a pen testing session. Um, fortunately for us, uh, Dr. Hamlin and his student, his researchers have asked us to help them with a research project in which uh, they would like us to do some pen testing on some applications that they're running. And so uh, I would really recommend you come out to that. It's going to be super neat. And you also get to contribute to research that's ongoing here at UTD right now uh, in the field of security. Uh, again, fire talks sometime in March or April. Uh, if you have anything you want to talk about for 15 to 30 minutes, write your ideas down, start preparing. Uh, sometime we will have a Saturday where we just have a long list of those where you can talk about anything security related. And lastly, of course, uh, we are streaming right now that we're just about to end. Uh, the video will also be available on YouTube as well as the slides on the website. Uh, thank you all for coming. If you have any questions, you can come ask me or Ian or any of the other officers or pretty much anyone.